Hello, welcome to this beautiful case demonstrating how to manage a complicated crown fracture on an upper right one. This is quite a unique case because I've actually managed to document it from day zero, including all initial symptoms, special tests, and unfortunately in this case, management when the pulp does finally necrose and the challenges of treating an open apex. As always, please subscribe and like. So this is a clever little flow chart showing the process from the initial trauma back in March 2021 to the final apexification treatment carried out in March 2022. So we have this fantastic little lady, she's aged eight years old, and she fractured her tooth playing on a bike, and the fracture actually exposed the pull, or in other words, called a complicated crown fracture. She wasn't too sure where the fractured piece had got to, but the patient assured us that she had not swallowed or inhaled it. There was no obvious trauma to the lip, so I'm certain that it's not embedded anywhere. In this case, however, significantly, I have not written in my notes when the trauma had taken place, but I was sure that it happened within the past four hours, but not under one hour. Upon intraoral examination, I found that the pulp was exposed, but only a pinprick, and the fracture line ran subgingival presenting an obvious challenge to restore eventually. Special tests indicate that the upper right one was not mobile and only had slight pain to lateral pressure. There was no pocketing, indicating there were no obvious subgingival fractures, and significantly pulp was responding positively to endofrost. Deciding the appropriate treatment for this patient was tough. Given the exposed pulp, I wanted to create an aseptic working field and place a strong seal around the exposure as quickly as possible. However, at this time, the patient's anxiety was very high. She'd also suffered a serious trauma, so was also reluctant to undergo further treatment. In the end, I felt the best treatment that could be carried out in this situation was just careful irrigation with chlorhexidine and the use of GIC, not under rubber dam. I agree it's not ideal, but best given the circumstances. So according to the relevant trauma guidelines, I reviewed her again in four weeks. The patient was much better. She was not having any pain. The filling was still intact and the tooth was responding positively to endofrost and not exhibiting any more signs or symptoms. However, one month later, after this review appointment, she started to exhibit some signs of necrosis. However, it was difficult to ascertain a coherent and reliable pain history as the filling had fallen off and the upper left one was responding negatively to endofrost but the upper right one was responding positively. We are then presented with a difficult decision. Is the tooth suffering from pulpal necrosis or irreversible pulpitis or is the pain from her lost fills? In other words, is it reversible pulpitis? This is an inherent issue when treating children and of course hindsight is 2020. Yet at the time I took the positive response response to endofrost as a sign of reversible pulpitis and decides to err on the side of caution and not access the pulpal space. I had also decided that her cooperation was much better and decided to place a composite filling under rubber dam and review. Of course, I gave the patient all of the facts and they were happy not to access the pulp at this time. Six months go by with no apparent symptoms reported from the patient. But when she did attend for a routine examination, there were signs of pulpal necrosis. The upper right one was now not responding to endofrost, and there was a possible apical radiolucency seen on the radiograph. But more significantly, when we compare the root ends of both the upper centrals, there was a difference in their stages of maturation. If you look closer on the radiograph, it can be seen quite clearly that the upper right one apex is significantly wider than the upper left one. This indicates pulpal necrosis and cessation of the root formation of the upper right one. To demonstrate the difference in mature and immature apex development, I have two teeth that I've extracted myself and these show clearly different stages of maturation. The tooth on the right has a wide open apex. The one on the left, however, is very small. It's really important to recognize that providing root canal treatment on teeth have a wide open apex like the one on the right is really difficult, particularly when obturating these teeth using conventional means. There are three main approaches recognized as a possible treatment modality for such teeth with a wide open apex. The first is a more traditional approach, placing calcium hydroxide in the canal space at a number of intervals, and this is to try and stimulate a hard tissue barrier at the apex. 
The second is a regenerative endodontic procedure, a very interesting treatment option, and again essentially involves stimulating stem cells to regrow the length and thickness of the root. Finally, a bioceramic barrier approach can be used. This involves creating a seal plug at the end of an open apex using a bioceramic putty. This treatment modality is now favoured over the calcium hydroxide approach as it can provide a quicker and more reliable result and in the case of our little girl it was the treatment provided. So most practitioners would carry out this technique in a single visit but in this case I carried it out in two visits. At the first appointment I had three goals to determine the working length, to irrigate and to place an intracanal medicament. Determining working length can be really difficult in a case like this as using an apex locator alone can provide unreliable results. I used a combination of an apex locator and the measuring tools found on the radiographic software and in this case it was Examen Pro used with software of excellence. Using these estimates I then took working length radiographs using GP points. The second goal is to render the canal space free from microorganisms. In this case I used sodium hypochlorite however others may suggest that using hypochlorite in a case such as this may be too risky. I also activated the solution with ultrasonic tips. In this case Irisafe tips. Final stage to dress the tooth I used non-setting calcium hydroxide. With the second apexification appointment, the goal was essentially to obturate the tooth. There are a few issues that need to be overcome with regard to this. The first is placing a bioceramic plug within a blunderbuss shaped apex. The second is to apically gauge the size or the diameter of the apex. And the final is to form the correct size bioceramic plug. In some cases with immature apices, the root does not taper at the end but opens up, or in other words, it's a blunderbuss shape. As you can imagine, it can be quite difficult to pack any any obturating material with this type of anatomy. The solution of course is to provide a resorbable barrier for the plug to be packed against. In this case you can use a haemocollagene sponge. It's important to note however that this should be done very carefully as heavy packing of this material can break away the thin and friable dentine walls of immature apex. The second problem to overcome is gauging the diameter of an open apex. This of course is almost impossible, mainly because most root canals are oval in shape. However, it's useful in a sense that it can aid when using the pellet former in the next stage. This is a gutter cutter, it's a very useful instrument and can change the diameter of a particular GP point. So you place the GP point in the required hole and you slide across the instrument to cut the GP point into a custom cone. When removed from the instrument, the GP point is now at the required size or diameter. The process of apical gauging is essentially cutting a GP point at varying diameters into at a relevant working length. The third and final stage is placing the correct amount of bioceramic to the required working length. I have a fantastic instrument called the Zmug Shavit pellet former and I hope I've pronounced that correctly. To use this instrument correctly, you cut a GP point to the relevant apical diameter. In our case with this, it's a 90. We know the width of the pellet former is 3.5 millimeters. Therefore, we take our custom GP point and cut 3.5 millimeters off the end. We are now ready to load the pellet former and in this case I'm using Wellroot PT Bioceramic Putty. The pellet former is then loaded to our desired diameter. Again, in our case it's 90. then the custom GP point is used to pick up this pellet and it's almost beautiful to see. Notice what we have now. We have 3.5 millimeters of the pellet on the end of the custom GP point, but the whole length of both the bioceramic plug and the GP point is the working length of the tooth.
This in theory is then used to place the pellet to the correct working length of the tooth. Once the initial pellet is placed, a radiograph is then taken to confirm if it is at the correct working length and if the volume is also correct, ideally 5mm. In this case, it was at a good length, but not enough biocerumic to fill approximately 5mm from the apex. Further obturation with bioceramic is required then, and the pellet former also has the ability to create generic size pellets to aid in placement. Once the bioceramic putty is packed into the pellet former, these pellets can then be easily picked up with a Mach 2 plugger and placed within the apical third of the tooth. Remember, gentle compaction. A second radiograph shows the amount of bioceramic apically is good and it is also at a good working length. The tooth is then backfilled with warm GP. Finally, the tooth is then restored with composite, which shows a really good result. With regard to the final thoughts of this case, I think it shows evidence of a, a number of issues and difficulties you can have when treating patients such as this. I think the main one is her age and her anxiety. When we first met her, she was very nervous, but over time she got better and better. This could have been a potential for her being permanently anxious after a significant event like this, but if managed appropriately, then this can be avoided. I think overall this case is a lovely example how to manage a case of trauma from start to finish. Mum and Dad were really happy and so was I. Thanks for watching and please give me a like and a subscribe.